Hello everybody, I'm Raphael Perry and it's time for some more sorcery. Now, when last I left, we were headed off down into the valley, so let's carry on with our journey. You head into the valley. It seems the safest route, secluded without providing an opportunity for ambush. And no matter how quickly darkness falls, the riverbank will guide your way. The man calls something after you about elvins, but you ignore it. The path winds alongside a bubbling stream. You follow it, keeping to the west bank. The valley itself becomes narrower on either hand. A good spot for an ambush. You can only hope that nobody knows you are here. After an hour's walk, you begin to feel hungry. You will need to eat at least once today to keep up your strength. I will eat. Taking a seat on the grassy bank above the water, you eat the sugary honeycomb. You rest for half an hour or so, and then continue on your journey. Well then, let's carry on into the valley. The valley continues, and you walk for many hours until the sun begins to set behind the bank and the air grows cool. Now would be the time to find and pitch camp if you intend to sleep before darkness descends completely. But the moon will rise soon enough, and you will, could walk on through the night. Somewhere beyond this valley, there are villages with real beds. Now, I could make camp and rest, recover some stamina, and be better suited to carry on on my way. If there was some kind of time pressure, however, oh yes to do with getting to Mampang before the Sorcerer King does anything really bad, uh, the Archmage, that is, then we would be in deep, deep trouble. However, there are Elvins about, and the old man, who was once young, has been transformed into an old man by the Elvins, apparently, and we... Ooh, we might get discovered by them as we sleep and they could play pranks on us these tricksy fairy creatures so it may be in our best interest to press on through the night that being said resting and recovering stamina at the moment this early on in our journey when we're down to half health would be really good so i think i'm going to do that yes now i actually spent a lot of time making this decision last time I played, so that's clearly a good decision point. It makes you think. After a little thought, you decide to stop. In the moonlight, the river will turn black and the way will be harder to find. Better to sleep and set off early tomorrow. You find a group of rocks that form a natural hollow beside the bank of the stream and settle yourself inside as comfortable as a rat in a hole. Before you decide to sleep, you check through your pack. You have two rations left, and I'll need those to get to the next village, so I'm not going to overindulge now. I'll just settle down to slumber. But you do not need to eat again today. One meal is enough. We got a stamina point back. We're recovering already. You rest your head onto your pack and close your eyes. Eventually, you drift off to sleep, soothed by the babbling of the stream. But a short while later, you are awakened by a splashing noise. I will... Right, I could lie low and keep quiet. Or sit up and take a look. Now, if I sit up, I could be seen. If I sit up... It depends on how low in the rocks I am, right? If I stay still, though, and I listen... Stuff could be moving around in the water coming towards me, and I wouldn't even know what it was. So I should probably look, because it could be dangerous. Looking out from your shelter, you see three small, thin, man-like creatures. But they are certainly not men. Their skins glow with a dull red luminescence, and they have spindly fingers and limbs as if made from sticks. And here they are, these strange, unusual creatures. The three are throwing stones into the water. Every so often, one chirps with glee when a good shot sends a fish up to the surface. From there, they seem to be able to draw the fish towards them using magical force. They are so busy with their task that they do not yet seem to have noticed you. 
And I, uh, I would say that appears to be leaping or lurching out of the water, but the fact that it's being drawn up telekinetically with magical power instead of leaping out of the water, because that jump looks all wrong. So yes, that makes more sense. That is a nice artwork. We're back on the lovely old John Blanche artwork again for the whole of the series. So settle back and enjoy glorious, magnificent, evocative pictures throughout. I could greet them boldly or stay still and try not to be seen. If they notice me, they could do something nasty. So, I will. There's no use hiding. They would find you and you would be at their disadvantage, stuck in this bower. So you wave and call out to the men who whirl around as soon as the hail passes your lips. They point and gabble excitedly to one another. One of them rises into the air and flies across the water to look at you more closely. You've never seen creatures like this before. I could speak to him or show that I'm able to defend myself. No, no, steady on now. No need to antagonize these bizarre creatures. Yet. Hail there, creature, you call out. The creature darts up higher into the air at your voice, then cautiously he approaches once more. What am I? What are you in our valley? A friend? I'm not so sure. A great warrior? I think they'd ask for proof. A traveller? Yeah, I mean, if I say I'm a friend, they might treat me like one of them and, and trick me and expect me to know things, but I don't. So I'm going to be cautious and tread the middle road here. I'm just a, just a humble traveller passing through. A traveller, you declare, on my way from one place to another and meaning no harm. Well then, traveller... Will you join me and my companions? You know, I will. If I say I'm going to go to sleep, I'm sensing this is a kind of trick-or-treat situation, right? If I say, look, guys, I just want to go, I just want to get some sleep, okay? Then they'll come do nasty things to me in my sleep. So no, I'll, I'll, I'll play along a bit, right? You rise from your bower and cross to the bank of the river where the other two creatures are. The creatures dance around you, nipping at your arms and splashing water on your legs. They turn their glows on and off, making delightful flashing patterns one moment, then plunging you into darkness the next, only to reappear suddenly in front of you to make you jump. It is charming, a charming, if somewhat threatening display, like the toothy smile of a tiger. After a while, you suddenly realize they are gradually leaving, le leading you down the river with their games and away from the rocks where you left your belongings. The fact that they're constantly flickering in and out so I can't see if they are there means one could go back and rob me. Uh, where are we heading? I don't know if they tell me the truth. Turn back, I think they take angrily to my bad manners. Let me show you something. Yes, let me show you something. It's in my bag, but I can't see my bag now. The elvins titter and giggle at their trick, but for all their mischief, they are as curious as cats. This way, calls one, leading you back down the river. We'll find your bag and things right where you left them. You follow, pleased with your scheme, until you come to back to the rocks where your possessions are still all safe. The elvins gather round, keen to see what you have for them. Um, I wanted to show them, like, the, some of the teeth or something, but okay, I'll give them a gold piece. You take a gold piece from your pouch. Here, for your trouble. One of the elven takes the coin, bites it, nods, then tosses it into the middle of the river. Shiny things look better underwater, he says to his friends, he adds. Fish for breakfast? And quite suddenly they are flying away up into the air, taking armfuls of their caught fish with them, and you are alone once more, and the valley is mercifully quiet. You sit up against the rocks, meaning to stay awake in case they return, but the sound of the water quickly lulls you to sleep. Once again, the crown fills your dreams. Only now, instead of being hidden away in Mampang Fortress by the Archmage, you see it on the head of the burly villager from Cantapani. Anyone can wear the crown, he declares to you, but wearing the crown, you are no longer just anyone. And then he points a finger at you that seems to crackle with energy, and you find yourself drawn towards him, commanded to do his bidding. 
Suddenly you are surrounded by angry bees. You are walking towards a crack in the ground. It always, it seems sure to swallow you whole. You stumble at its edge, about to fall. And awake for next morning. The morning air is cool and 12 stamina, 12 stamina. Just saying, you know, happy, excited, cheery, hooray. <laughs> you feel a little stronger than yesterday. Still halfway between sleeping and waking, you feel the presence of your spirit, the monkey, close nearby. Its form has changed since you left Anilan, just as you have changed, but it is still walking beside you. In the temple, they taught you that a prayer to your spirit could heal disease, lift curses, even save you from certain death. But the spirits are not generous and decline to help often. You can ask for spirit's aid using the prayer but pray button. I will not, though. Um, this, this was something in the original series that was slightly different. It was praying to one of the gods or goddesses. I think the, the goddess of luck. I can't remember, for, for salvation. We don't have a disease. We'll keep replenishing our stamina over the course of the adventure until we get to card, at which point it should be on full. And um, we're, we're not in a certain death situation, so I'd like to save this for an emergency. I think we, we were allowed to do it once or twice over the course of the entire adventure. Let's walk on. You wake and set off down the stream once more. After a few hours, you come across a rope bridge strung precariously between two boulders and spanning the river. A path leads away from its other side and runs over a small hill. So, up here, we have some kind of village, but I'd like to stay on this side of the Simsosa River. The Simsosa River sounds like it's related to the great Olimpopo River. Ah, yes, good memories. I'm staying on this side for now, because there's a forest coming up, and I could explore that, maybe get a bit of shelter. I like the fact that as we grow accustomed to the harsh air of this district, of this region, rather, we, we get better, you know, we, we begin to recover. You continue alongside the riverside path for several more hours until you reach a wide bend. In its elbow is a cluster of huts made of thatched branches and twigs. It is clearly not unoccupied as smoke rises from a fire set in a space between the dwellings, but there is no sound to be heard. I think I will go visit this local village. You approach cautiously, creeping between the outlying huts, peering through cracks in the walls, but the place does appear truly deserted. I'll look in on the huts. I don't. If I walk into the middle of a village, I could be ambushed, right? But if I look in on a few huts around the edge, step into a hut, I only have to deal with what's in that hut. Until I step outside. All the huts have brightly coloured drapes hanging in their doorways. Each is a different colour, and they flicker and move tantalisingly in the breeze. Now, last time, I cast a spell, and I should probably do that again. I will cast... Uh, S... U... Sus... Suspect... Yes, to suss out sense danger. I'll do that. You cast the spell and a deep calm comes over you as an inner voice begins to soothe you. Then a moment later, calm becomes panic as you realise there are traps everywhere, in the central brazier and each of the huts, but your inner voice tells you not to be unduly afraid. The red-draped hut contains a treasure for those whose favour, who favour right. The green door is safe enough, only the brown-doored hut is truly after your blood. Okay. The spell fades and you are alone once more. Well then. Which hut will you visit first? Look, the red one's closest. I'll go there. Last time I cast a different spell by mistake. Uh, well, not by mistake. It's just this time I went a bit different. Last time I cast a spell to show me the, 
the safest route out of danger. And it was like, yeah, the safest way is to just walk out the village, mate. <laughs> the hunt with the red... The, the hut, not hunt. The hut with the red drape is smaller than the other two, and its curtain does not cover the doorway properly. Peering through, you make out a low table with three stools around it and two boxes on the table. One on the left, one on the right. I will go inside and investigate. You step inside. There is no one here and the boxes have a very thin layer of dust on their surface. Otherwise, they look quite uninteresting. Neither fancy nor ornamented. I mean, they look a little ornamental. Each is sealed with a small catch. Now, if we hadn't cast that spell, you could remember the old man in the last episode told us the riddle, see him though he sees you not, in a box that isn't left. To guard a key, it is his lot. To jail a witch of luck bereft, I think was the riddle. So we've had two clues indicating the box on the right, and even though left is best, and it's a fighting fancy book, look, the fighting fancy rule exists as a default for if you don't have any other clues, and there are still exceptions. So, we'll open the box on the right. You flip open the top of the box, then freeze quite still. Inside, there are several gold pieces and a key, but whoever left these treasures has not left them unprotected. Crawling around inside the box, shifting the coins with its feet and sting, is a scorpion. Right, look, uh, the key, all of the coins are the same, right? There's no indication that, look, this is a special coin, you need to get this one. So I would consider them to be fairly normal. The key, on the other hand, is a more unique item. I will try to grab it. Stealing yourself, you plunge your hand into the box to grab the key. You manage to retrieve it before the scorpion can reach you. From inside the box, the scorpion chitters and scratches. Okay, it's getting agitated. It's likely to sting me if I go in there again, right? And while I have plenty of stamina, that sting could be a an auto kill, right? It could be a you're dead. You've been too greedy. So I imagine if I went for the coins first, I might have been able to get some. And then... If I went for the key or more coins, I would get stung, right? It's like the beast has awoken. I will close the box. You flip the box closed carefully. You take a moment to examine the key. Who knows if it will be of any use? It's old and rusted. If you even find the right lock somewhere out there, you can only hope it doesn't snap on the pins. I could open the box on the left, but given that it's a trap... And the trap favours the right. I ain't even going to touch the left box. That'll be something much worse. You step back outside into the sunlight. Well then. Look, the green doorway is slightly closer. I will go there. You try the hut with the green drape. I'll call inside. You know, just being friendly. You call inside, but there's no reply. It is as empty as the last, it seems. Well, I'll go in, just since it's, you know, I've been informed. Ooh, from monkey to ape. Drawing back the drape, you enter the hut. Cushions ring the room, and as you step inside, a strange music playing on invisible pipes seems to fill it. The tune is pleasant and relaxing. This place seems one of safety and comfort. I think, drawing back the drape, you enter the hut at the same time as transforming from monkey to ape spirit, is a reference, a very subtle reference. Now, this sentence was in the original book years ago, but combining that with the, with the ape spirit, I think is a reference to Fighting Fantasy Book 3, the encounter with the ape man in the house, in the treehouse, right? Where you go up into the treehouse and he draws back the drape or curtain to discover you. I think that's a reference, and if it's not, it's a really nice synergy. So I will sit and listen to the music. You take a seat on one of the cushions. The music sways around you, and you wonder whether spending just a little while longer here will not restore your strength. You find yourself humming to the tune, tapping your feet to its cascading rhythms. 
Remembering the pipe in your pack, you pull it out, uncertain whether playing would benefit the spell of this place or break it asunder. I'll play a bit. You decide that the risk is worth taking. Lifting the pipe to your lips, you begin to play along and whatever spirits are singing in this place join with you, adapting their tune to fit yours. The effect is beautiful and restful and you soon feel much better for it and have even recovered a stamina point, too, into the bargain. When you finally stand to go, it is with a bow to the empty room before you head back out into the village centre. Well then, I shall enter the brown hut. Do you still want to visit the final hut? Yes, I believe I do. Might as well before I leave the village. You approach a doorway covered by a brow plain brown drape made from tanned bearskin. The hut seems unusually silent. Well, I'll knock on the frame. You knock at the frame. No answer. Well, I'll go inside all the same. You lift the drape and step inside. The hut is obviously someone's abode, as there are pots, pans and cloves strewn about. In the shadows, in front of an open fireplace, is a skin rug, not bear this time, but wolfhound. Well, I'll search around the hut in case I can find anything fancy. You begin to carefully search the room, looking for anything that might give a clue as to the fate of the owner. But the biggest clue is one you miss until it is too late. The wolfhound rug has both skin... Ah. The wolfhound skin rug has both its eyes, and one of the eyes has opened. I could draw my sword, but I shall cast a spell. And the spell I choose will be G O O B for Goblin! Requires a Goblin's Tooth. I have four of them. Let's do it. You pull out one of your Goblin Teeth and enchant it quickly before tossing it up to the floor between you and the Wolfhound. In a flash, a Goblin Warrior is created and he engages with the Wolfhound in vis with vicious glee. Oh, look at that struggle there. There seems to be a second goblin here who uh, I haven't summoned yet. Maybe that's a hint that I should summon a second one. But look at that wolfhound. I mean, that is a rough fight and that's got a fancy collar. Okay. Their fight is harsh and although the beast eventually tears the goblin's throat clean away, it has been left badly wounded by the encounter. I could summon another goblin to try and wound it or finish it off or I'll just finish it off myself. I'm going to fight now, the wolfhound is badly wounded. You draw your sword to finish the bloody work. I'm going all in. I may be able to kill it with a single blow. It's so badly wounded I don't think it can muster full strength for an offensive counterattack. For an animated rug, the wolfhound is terrifying. It paces towards you, jaws dripping. You charge headlong as the wolfhound weakly opens its jaws to bite you, plunge your blade through its skull. It collapses to the floor, now destined to be nothing but a rug for all time. No stamina lost. Flawless fighting. We have done well. With the howling and wailing of the wolfhound gone, the hut and the village seem terribly quiet once more. Well, I will search its body. You pause to quickly search the hound's body. Strangely, for a beast, it is wearing a collar studded with green gems. You take it with you, then head back outside. Where to next? There is nothing more to see here. Well then, do we have a spell that requires a green gem? Let's see. So, let's review. We have gold pieces. We have 13 gold pieces. That's fine. We have beeswax. We have ba a bamboo flute. We have goblin's teeth. We have a giant's tooth. We don't have any glue. We have a medicinal potion. Probably the blimberry, right? Uh, pop. We don't have any pebbles yet, apparently. We, we never took the opportunity to pick any up. Sand. Okay. Nose plug, skull cap, black face mask, jewel of gold, so not green, gold backed mirror, fire water, stone dust, yellow powder, 
gale horn, oak sapling, a brass pendulum, a jewel studded medallion, not a collar, pearl ring. Uh, yeah, pearl ring, a sun jewel, which is yellow, bracelet of bone, green haired wig, which we still haven't found yet, a green ring, crystal orb, holy water. And of course, here we have the Z spell. The Z spell, I'll read it here, okay, for those of you not familiar. This is the most formidable spell in lore, but no one knows why. In all recorded history, this spell has been cast only once by a powerful necromancer from Throben, who was never seen again. Its effects are unknown. The necromancer's notes were found, but were crazed and unclear. Treat with extreme caution. This is a spell we will not cast unless under the most dire circumstances. For now, though, we're just going to leave the village. Taking no further chances here, you leave the village and follow the river further upstream for an hour. You reach the river once more, but now the path goes across it. Before you can see, bit, sorry, beyond, you can see a long, wide track with trees lining the left-hand edge and a wide field of long grass on the right. In the far distance, the curl of smoke indicates a village. The evening is beginning to draw in. It would be good to reach town before the light is gone, Then I shall test the bridge to see if it's sturdy. Before crossing, you make sure to test the guy ropes of the bridge to ensure it is sound, but it seems safe enough. Satisfied, you make your way across the boards. In the middle of the bridge, a man stops you. Perhaps if I had not tested the bridge, he wouldn't have had time to get in my way. Halt, he declares. This is my bridge, and to cross, you must pay the toll. Well, how much is it? How much is your fare, you ask? The toll is just one gold piece, he says. It's very reasonable. Yeah, I'll pay that. It's a reasonable toll, you remark, and put one gold piece in his hand. The man touches his forehead with the coin in thanks, and with that he strides away, whistling. You head off down the bridge and back into the path, none the wiser. You have a long way still to travel today. Well then, along this path we go. Wait, we can't go anywhere else, can we? Uh, no, we can't go there. So we come there from these options, right? And this is a like a point of no return. So on we go. Oh, that is a wonky path, isn't it? Let's just go straight to it. The bath. The path. Path with a P, not bath with a B. The path continues along the side of a line of trees. Suddenly, an acorn lands on your head and you hear a tittering from overhead. You look up into the trees. Elvin! I see one, two, three elvin faces. And many, many acorns pelting down upon me. I could cast a spell, threaten them, or walk on by. I'm going to cast a spell. Now, there's a reasoning to this, but let's, let's go into it. I will cast... W, O, O, K, walk, to create a shield. Now, that's one stamina. Now, I don't know if they would throw enough acorns to cause more than one point of damage, or if it would do something else, like, oh, an acorn hits you in the eye, take minus one skill until you rest, or something, like, rest three times, right? So, you place a gold piece on your wrist and cast the spell. An invisible shield forms around it, large enough for you to cover your head. You're able to pass safely through the hail of acorns. Soon, you're out of reach of the annoying creatures. Let's approach Christatanti. What a lovely name for a village. The sun is now just past its zenith, and everywhere a dusty heat rises from the baked earth. You begin to think about where you will stay for the night. Another village, uh, sorry, another night sleeping out in the open would be best avoided. But then you see a small village set on into the hill. I'll look at it. Smoke rises from the stacks. The houses are well set with stone at their bases and thatched roofs of grasses and thick leaves. There is, unusually, more than just one, the one street running through the centre of town. 
but it is as though this place, once rich, has had its heart scooped away. Litter surrounds the buildings, and on the edge of the village are rows and rows of empty, abandoned houses. You continue your slow trudge along the path. We could completely avoid the village or go right in. Now, I've only got provisions for two more days, right? So I would probably like to buy some more. I shall enter the village. You walk into the village. Young hill dwellers pass you by and stare at your strange clothes. You nod back respectfully, but I will look at them. Their own attire is rough by comparison to your gear. They wear their hair long, but piled up on their heads. These people are ghastly poor. The village is like a ghost town here on the knife edge of the backlands. I could go to the inn or talk in an alehouse. I'll talk. I'll see what rumours I can uncover. Walking down the single road, you quickly find a hut with its front covering pulled op wide open and the smell of brewed beer coming from inside. You go in. Several hill dwellers are here talking gruffly. When you enter, they watch you with understandable caution. And I've got to say, that's a very cautious looking face. Look at that expression of his mouth, his eyebrows pulled down. Oh, yes, we got this. I think this might be a woman leaning in. We got this towering individual, just massive head, wide shoulder, but just stops short of coming down here. So the shoulder isn't so wide, it's the head. It's just huge. And this person looks like he might as well be asleep. The owner of the hut comes over to you. Welcome to Christotanti, he declares. What do you want? I'll greet the owner. It's only polite to do so, right? An evening's rest and a drink to wet my throat, you reply. Earl is one gold piece, he answers. Please sit. You go over to the table where the hill dwellers are. I could sit with the oldest man or sit with the youngest man. Um, this is a rural village. Um... They probably respect their elders. It might be disrespectful for me to sit with the youngest man. That being said, the old man just want, might want to have some peace and quiet. I'll sit with the oldest man. You turn your attention to the oldest man at the table. Whatever face he ha once had is lost in a labyrinth of wrinkles, and his skin is the colour of tanned hide from a lifetime in the beating sun. Ah, this must be the oldest man, then this could be the younger man, right? I'm not going to... What are you looking at? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to pick a fight, right? Greetings, old man. He raises his mug in salute. Hmm, gravelly. Stranger, stranger. His voice is gravelly, like the dusty dirt that lines the streets of his town. Where are you from? I come from Manorland. Hard to deny. He nods. Not many has crossed through the Cantapani Gate in either direction, if you know what I'm saying. Anorland must be kept safe. That's kind of like national arrogance that might not go down well for locals. So yeah, I, I've got a good idea what you mean. I understand you. He grins and picks his teeth with a fingernail. They say there is a war coming. Something to do with the crown. A crown, you say? You ask cautiously. The crown of kings, he says. They say it's how the leader leads. Without the crown on your head, no one will follow you. The crown can raise an army from a farmyard or command a population to walk into the sea. He shakes his head. Sounds like a bad idea if you ask me. But if someone's got to wear it, I'd rather they were in Omla land than Mampang. You sip your beer. The old man exchanges glasses, glances with the younger man sitting opposite. You know, at this point, he's indicated the young man, sent him a signal. If I engage him in the conversation, yeah, so it's like, yeah, he shouldn't be left out. I should include him. You thank him from the conversation. You catch the young man's eye. He moves over to be right beside you, close enough to whisper in your ear, but you don't quite catch what he says. I think he tried to pick my pocket. 
and if I ask him to repeat it, he'll do so successfully. I think the old man was giving him a hint to rob me, so I'm going to just edge away on the bench here. You get back to your feet. The young man giggles to himself, but does not attempt to stop you. I'll finish my beer and leave. You make to leave the inn. The owner stops you, holding out his hand. Well, I haven't paid him yet, so I'll pay him. I'm not going to push him out of the way. You pay him his gold piece and step out into the street. You look this way and that, trying to decide what to do next, when you realise the old man has joined you once more. He grabs your shoulder and presses a fruit into your hand. Bomba! He declares through fermented breath. I grow em myself. Good for the stomach. He pats your belly and walks away, swaying slightly. I'll look at the fruit. You turn the old man's gift over in your hands. It is a thick, rinded fruit that keeps well and will be highly nourishing when you decide to eat it. Its only drawback is its incredible weight. It is now evening and time to sleep. Well, I've gained food, right? I could sleep outside the town, possibly in one of the ruined outbuildings, or just go sleep at the inn. I'll do that, to be honest. You stop a passerby and ask for an inn, and they lead you there directly. The woman who runs the place stands in the doorway with her arms folded. Are you from the king? she demands. Well, while I'm on a mission for the king, this is an entire village full of people who are poverty-stricken. And if they knew that I was here from the king, they would either think I'm here to collect taxes or that I have a lot of money. And either way, things would probably not turn out well for me. So maybe don't tell them all about that. No, I'm, I'm just a mere traveller. The woman narrows her eyes at you. This is a guest house, the best in Christotanti. Only guests stay, and any guest of mine knows that it costs me three gold pieces to host a man overnight, and two to feed him. But it's all between friends. Well, look, I've got my own food. I've now got three meals worth of food, so I'll just take a room. The woman shows you the way upstairs to a room. There are three other guests already staying and asleep, so you settle quickly. The bed is not clean, but it is comfortable, and after the long day and all its narrow escapes, you are grateful beyond measure for the rest. I will absolutely eat some of my provisions, because I haven't really eaten properly today. Before you close your eyes, you quickly eat a quantity of your cheese and bread. You feel better for it, and it will help you sleep. Your dreams are vivid once again. You are walking endlessly, the hills moving up and down under your feet like a rippling sea. Every step exhausts you, but no one step moves you forwards. Meanwhile, a scorpion has crept into your gold pouch and is nestling down between the coins, ready to sting you when you next go to buy food. And in the distance, a deep voice is booming with laughter. The long, cruel fingers of one hand are curled around the iron frame of a crown, and with the other hand he beckons you forwards as if into a trap, and we're back up to 14 stamina. You wake early and sit for a moment, in no great hurry to leave the village. This is now the third day of your journey, and the muscles in your legs are feeling lean and strong from so much walking. You spend a short while enjoying the peace, then unhurriedly collect your possessions and set off along the path. Christotanti is surrounded by several miles of fields. It sits in a well-protected ring of hills and is close enough to the river to be reasonably prosperous. As you follow the path between the lines of sun-baked crops, you come to a fork in the road. The right-hand way leads past a set of outbuildings, while the left leads directly off into deep woodland. And I think I'm going to leave this decision until the very next episode. I hope you've all enjoyed this one, and I do. Look forward to seeing you all in the very next episode, which will be airing pretty soon. I'm going to say goodbye for now, though, and cheerio, everyone! Hope to see you all next time.